Well, the wind at uh, Donald Trump's back could be this big endorsement by the New York Post uh, saying that Donald Trump can win the Republican nomination, but that he would need to pivot a little bit. Quoting here, the Post pivot Trump needs to be more presidential, better informed on policy, more self discipline less thin skin. Historian Bill uh, Bert, uh, Folsom on that. Um, you know, they always talk about Donald Trump being an acquired taste. We've had other candidates who ran for president who were acquired taste. They really didn't change their mojo very much when they became president. In other words, what you got early on was what you got in the Oval Office and uh, with mixed success. But it, it takes a lot for, for someone to completely change their basic DNA, doesn't it? Well, it certainly does. What you see in a presidential contender before he or she is president is what you see when that person is in the White House. And we've seen that on many occasions, Neil. You know, um, Andrew Jackson is the one president uh, who has been most often compared to being Trump-like, or shall I say Trump, Anderson, Andrew Jackson-like, in that he was a controversial figure, uh, one who had been, if you heard it back in those days, robbed by the establishment, comes storming back, and was not exactly everyone's cup of tea. Does that analogy hold? Did Andrew Jackson ever change uh, once he got in? Andrew Jackson was a very rough and tumble frontiersman, and he remained that way to uh, his whole life. Uh, he killed a man in a duel. Uh, he was an Indian fighter. He was shot by future Senator Thomas Hart Benton and barely survived. Uh, when he got in the White House, he would. Uh, South Carolina was threatening to not pay their taxes on imports, the tariff. And when Jackson heard that, he threatened to send troops in and was even talking about hanging someone uh, for treason. So Jackson followed that through into his presidency. And you know, he was considered in retrospect as a president, one of our greatest. So I guess what yes. I'm asking you is, when we make a big deal about presumed character flaws, uh, the New York Post mentioned them, others have mentioned them, in Donald Trump, could those work in his favor, that no-nonsense Jacksonian style, if he were to become president? Yes, it could, because Jackson was very much admired for his right-on integrity and his honesty and his forthright uh, speech. And it's also useful to remember the whole federal budget was uh, uh, bal not only balanced, but no na the national debt disappeared during Jackson's presidency. Now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about someone who was a, thought of a little bit differently when he was being considered for president, Grover Cleveland, that he was almost too goody two shoes, too quiet, too unassuming, um, too, I think the words were incorruptible at the time, yet he's yes. famous for having served two different terms, so he's recognized as uh, two different presidents in our history, the only uh, man who did not serve those terms concurrently. Uh, having said that, how did that play out, those, those estimations of Grover Cleveland uh, and his actual presidential performance? He was incorruptible, Neil, and he had a, an incredible sense of honesty and duty. And when he became president, he refused to take any bribes. He refused to give anybody a special subsidy. And the end result was that he had so many vetoes. He had 414 vetoes in his first term, which was more than all the previous presidents <laughs> combined. And yet there was this feeling that because he was a, a straight arrow, I think uh, another play on words here is that he... He would be a wuss. He would be a wimp. Uh, and that didn't pan out as, as scripted no. either, did it? He was very hard-nosed, and he could be very stubborn and could not be pushed around. All right. The last of our examples here, that there was a worry about Calvin Coolidge assembly, uh, you know, assuming the presidency, that he was Mr. Vanilla, that he was not the kind of guy that inspired you know, a great deal of confidence coming as he did inheriting the office. Um, assess how that went. Well, he also had a real sense of thrift, personally, very thrifty, and he had an economy of words, of course, we know that, he didn't talk <laughs> much, but he didn't spend much either. He and Harding managed to cut the federal budget in half, Neil. But Harding and was Coolidge... bigger than life figure, and I know when he dies, there's Calvin Coolidge who's emerged, uh, he's, he's yes. sworn his president, I think his dad had, had swore him in. Um, he did, and, 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 his and father the, did. And the rap against old Cal is that he didn't have nearly the luster, the pizzazz, the excitement uh, of Harding. Uh, how did it work out for him? 
It worked out well. He didn't have a lot of spazazz. One time in a radio interview, he was asked if he had anything to say to his audience, and he, all, all he said was, goodbye. <laughs> so uh, he, didn't, he didn't speak much, but he vetoed bills that needed to be vetoed. And these budget surplus were, were incredibly valuable for the United States. He cut the federal debt under Harding and Coolidge, was cut by almost one-third. Yeah, amazing. And I think it's a good reminder. I'm so glad you came here just to remind us in the past when there were concerns about a kind, either his language, his tone, his temperament, and yes. they surprised him. They surprised him. That is not to say I have no way to guess on Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or any of this other stuff that's come up during campaigns. But again and again, I think they had doubts about this guy, Abe Lincoln, but that's another story. Right. Professor, always good. Have a good weekend, my friend. Thank you, Neil.